good evening friends it is a very momentous uh, situation and momentous day for the portals of uh, iages the indian association of gastroenterology and endoscopic surgeons the iages have been uh, untiringly working on various types of uh, learning modules basic surgeries mass classes national collaborations regional collaborations various courses in its ongoing endeavor on bringing the policy makers to be available for our uh, knowledge sharing we have two eminent personalities uh, today on board with us dr abhijit shah the president of the national board of uh, examinations at new delhi the apex body of uh, examinations in various medical specialties of india and uh, we have another than uh, dr pavanindra lal sir Uh, he is the executive director of the national board of examinations new delhi taking care of all the operational uh, aspects of the national board and uh, being a surgeon i like think a bad body of the uh, administration and uh, i am in fact very happy to introduce to all of you our president dr raman goel uh, who is the president of the igs and he is also an eminent teacher and uh, where he went on to specialize in a very limited area and he has set trend that specializing in one area gives more optimal results and on the other side he has concentrated on various activities of iags teaching imparting training imparting various fellowships and organizing situational required programs especially iags was essentially imparting covid related issues and iags has published guidelines for various surgical uh, practitioners on minimal invasive surgery and covid situation so truly iags have touched upon all the spectrum of important uh, surgical aspects of uh, practice training education and now we are in the most important day of discussing the policy matters of the education with that few words let me start it on formally introducing uh, professor pavanindra lal sir Professor Pavanindra Lal Sir is the Executive Director, National Board of Examinations. He is the Director Professor, Department of Surgery at the Malana Azad Medical College and Associated Lok Naik Hospital in New Delhi, and he is a very senior and eminent laparoscopic GA oncology and bariatric surgeon. And uh, he is uh, the head of the prestigious Clinical Skill Centers at the Malana Azad Medical College, and he is the Chair of the Division of Renal Access Surgery. and he is the editor in chief at the Maulana Azad Medical College Journal of Medical Sciences he is the vice president of the International College of Laparoscopic Surgeons the president elect of the Indian Hernia Society and he is the president of the Associations of uh, Surgeons of India the chapter and of course he has a array of uh, other commitments as well he is the chairman of the surgical instruments committee bureau of indian standards and to add further to his cap many national and international awards have been bestowed upon him the most important one he is the second generation dc roy national award winner a very very uh, i would say a prestigious situation where both father and son getting the recognition in the medical fraternity and he is also been the proud uh, winner of the commonwealth fellowship award instituted by the ugc as year is 2007 i'm sure there is a long list of achievements for uh, dr pavanindra lal to be read i am sure sir we will be benefited on hearing from him now i have the honor of uh, introducing the president of the national board of examination dr abhijit shay has uh, had his post graduation in super specialty of cardiothoracic surgery from shade kane school of post graduate medicine and research ahmedabad He extensively has worked as an academician at various medical colleges in Ahmedabad. In 1998, he went to UK for more specialized training in cardiothoracic surgery, where he has worked at multiple institutions in the United Kingdom. To mention, the Freeman Hospital at Newcastle was one of the eminent, eminent places. And he went on to get qualified both in the FRCS in general surgery from the Glasgow College. and then he specialized in the cardiothoracic surgery exam also later he shifted his uh, 
training to St. George's Hospital NHS Trust in London, where he had the opportunity to work with one of the most eminent cardiothoracic surgeon, Professor Brendan B. Madden. Dr. Shayat has a long and distinguished career in cardiothoracic surgery, cardiothoracic research, and academia in India and then extensively in the UK. He has to his credit more than 20 review, peer reviewed publications, 40 abstract presentations, and more than 40 international conference presentations at various world societies. His major research and publications are in the field of large airway intervention, sildenafil therapy for patients with pulmonary hypertension. And then he has spent more than 10 years on learning academics, imparting academics, and researching academics at St. George's Hospital, where he has successfully guided and implemented the training program both in developing competency on various cardiothoracic segmental areas on echocardial intervention, pulmonary artery catheterization, and management of patients with secondary pulmonary hypertension. Dr. Okay, Shade also has taken his MD research degree from the University of London under supervision of Professor Brendan B. Madden, and he's also a management uh, specialist. He has got his MBA health executive from Kira University, Manchester. Again, the list continues. Let me get the ball rolling. Now I hand over the proceedings to our president, Dr. Raman Goval, to set the questions on. Over to you, Dr. Raman. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanagrim, for the introductions. And friends, it's a, it's a great occasion to have two leaders who are helping decide the national policy on medical education. And more than being the leaders, they are both surgeons, so it's so much easier to understand how they think, how they talk, and what you want to be the future of medical education because it's heads of surgeons now. So I think uh, it gives a lot of comfort to us on one side. On the other side, we have a medical education which is at a crossroads today. Uh, because of the sudden change of medical council of India to national medical education, and on the other side, uh, the COVID has just disrupted the training program for almost a year. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome uh, Professor Sheet and Dr. Pavaninder Lal, President and Executive Director of uh, the Board, National Board of Examination, on the IDGS platform, because. This, uh, this gives us an opportunity to reach out to thousands and thousands of surgeons and their children who are studying in different medical colleges and uh, uh, national board hospitals and have, have issues which they wanted to raise. And as I was mentioning just before this program, I have never seen this kind of excitement about the IHS program, what I have seen in the last three days. Because whichever doctor and whichever friend of mine I spoke, he or his wife immediately had questions regarding medical education. So I think that that shows the, the kind of requirement that we are meeting out today. And so uh, taking the first, it's more a conversational issue that uh, to, to Dr. Shaikh, the first question is that there has been a lot of consternation or doubts regarding the structure of governance of medical and education in our country this is this is what what i have been experiencing and people have been asking in the last three days so as a person who is leading this and as a person who has extensively stayed in united kingdom you are yourself a cardiothoracic surgeon and since you are in a policy making situation where do you see the future of medical education generally uh, say a decade later in our country Dr. Shade, please. Please unmute yourself, sir. Uh, you'll have to unmute. Dr. Shade, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Now, let's just take an uh, overview of what is happening around with the medical education in the country. Now, uh, there is so much of criticism has gone in the last few years uh, regarding the restructuring mm -hmm. of medical education and medical education has to percolate and advance into the farthest uh, institutions of India and uniformity is a question that 
diversity as an issue, dichotomy is an issue. Uh, now, having said that, all criticism and talking about the problems of uh, medical education, I would say one thing that we haven't gone grossly wrong in our medical education. If you will see the history of decades, the India is given the highest talent. Uh, even before the IT, it's all the talent which were in the medical field to the whole world. And I think that we should not be ignoring that unless we have our basic medical education is strong, we couldn't have done this so far. So uh, what is the problem? Problem is not about the talent. The problem is about the uniformity, lack of uniformity, diversity, and dichotomy. For example, uh, in a one state, you have a, a little state. I'll give you an example that the WHO recommends one is 2,000 doctors ratio. Now, it's fine that India doesn't have one is 2,000 ratio, and we need to we need to reach that. Uh, now, important is uh, if you go to the southern states. Now, many of the southern states have one in thousand ratio. So while if you go to the northeastern states and other states, this ratio is grossly missing. So the one biggest challenge for policymakers in medical education and government and regulating agencies is to integrate system in such a way that we should bring the uh, best out of the medical education. We can reform the medical education in the way that it percolates to the farthest uh, institution of the country and at the same time it takes an account of all the complexities in the field of medicine which has been up over the last uh, two three decades uh, let us uh, have a review about it that as yes, you said that there's a lot of uh, uh, doubts or discussions and criticisms now, what is happening uh, at the moment? We have two regulating, uh, two regulation, uh, regulating bodies. Now, our body is by and large primarily is not regulating body, but we are responsible for postgraduate medical education in India, uh, National Board of Examination. And we form about the one, we contribute about the one fourth of the postgraduate medical uh, doctor's workforce in India. On the other side, the NMC, which was a previous the Medical Council of India, is contributing to two-thirds of the medical postgraduate medical students' workforce across the India. So that is the one part. Second, we have a two system in the country, the private medical system, public medical system. And uh, we both systems have this pros and cons. Uh, but we know that in the last 20 years, the corporate healthcare system has advanced tremendously and very strongly. And certainly, it has created a very strong foundation and uh, what we call it an opportunities for the coming uh, medical generation to have a uh, at most to the state of art medical uh, technology equipments. And even to the access of access to the medical education. Now, where is the problem? Problem is this: all all uh, institutions, organizations, even the central organizations, until now they were largely worked parallel to each other, and there was no integration between two systems. Now, this is the if I compare with the UK system or Western system, mm -hmm. in Western system. For the purpose of medical education, the integration of institution, in integration of the uh, resources like faculties, like uh, specialist centers, like subspeciality exposure, this all has been integrated so well that uh, it's far better than us for them to get a more structured training 
in the given specialties like your specialty of best friend so what you are this so what has happened that this is something which we are discussing about that we need to integrate the system in the best possible way where we utilize the each of our strength not the weaknesses and every institution strength to each other and we utilize and we invest into that in such a way that our uh, medical doctors are in the best way by getting the opportunities for the best possible treatment so that is the one important issue is an integration are net to net second important issue bata band kar do is the regulation now, this is very important uh, i ah. used to uh, learn a lot of management uh, things before that if if the right if we are not regulating ourselves or our uh, organizations or our institutions and if we go very linearly and loosely then certainly the what you call it the basic uh, work culture or the discipline uh, amongst the institutions are not going to come up to that level so this is the second most important is uh, possibly the regulating bodies yeah. has to be little bit stronger and more objective on the principle to ensure that the medical education uh, reaches to the level of expectations now you respect you whether it is a dnp whether it is md or whether it is ms uh, the third important point is as uh, uh, everyone has a concern that there is a lot of uh, cable service when you turn from the one system to the another system when the changes happens uh, there is always a chance of uh, little bit of cable around because people doesn't know what the new system will bring in what the new system will have initiative so by the time they gets ready uh, there is always a concern and there is always a doubts about it but i am confident that the objectives which was built up in uh, the new policy reforms uh, with whatever the nmc or national board of examination i think there are more focus on achieving the excellence in the medical education now it may look little bit uh, 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 disorganized at this stage but i promise you that in coming 5 or 10 years uh, we will get far above uh, the expectations uh, in the sense that we will be much better organized we will have a access all of our regional institutions will get better the access of the medical education will get better and certainly the uh, uh, all these complexities will be built in the last point which i would uh, tell you is the conventional system of medical education is a, a, a physical education now we all learned from the covid uh, time that the physical education is grossly missed in the year 2020 and that has led to uh possibly uh, fast track innovations in the online learning system e learning platforms and all these things i always picked up the principle in this way that we should have a three arms in the education system the one is physical you cannot replace the physical education it has to be there and that is the gold standard on which we could send so many doctors across the world so physical education is the one most important pillar which has to stay on the second important pillar is a uh, skill based education which is very very important when the technology is advanced into the medical education lot of such uh, sub specialties have to has been built even in the your gastroenterology lot of sub specialties has been built so second is a skill based education which needs to be built in and the third important thing is a standardization of education the standardization of education and the effective use of the resources uh, faculty resources you can do it with the online uh, portal or e learning portal even to the extent that you can 
that we have gotten access to, to the global uh, leaders to contribute to the medical education in India. So this is my uh, uh, my thought about it. So in conclusion, I will say that please give some time for these reforms to get implemented, and we should not be concluding it too early and too quickly. That is number one. Number two. We must have a physical, digital mode of education where physical, skill-based, and digital, all three should complement each other. That cannot replace with each other. And third important piece, we must build up very strong research and academic capabilities like publication capabilities and others. For that, we, have, we need to have three virtues. One is we if someone is able to criticize, someone is able to debate, someone is able to argue, these are the inherent characteristics of academics, which we should take it positively, and that will certainly help to improve our systems. And I welcome all this criticism from my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seth. I think that was, that was a very detailed explanation of how things are going. Though it's a little concerning that, you know, we need to wait for five to ten years for things to, to clear up. But I think uh, as uh, the, the leadership has taken charge and all, all of you are well aware of the problems on ground, you, you understand that uh, those postgraduates who are going through this, uh, this training or, or the, the, the transition phase are, are not getting adequately tra trained either or they are, they are going through a through a situation where they don't know where uh, how well they are trained but i'm sure once the COVID things is over uh, things should be uh, brighter in future taking taking a point to dr pavaninder lal and dr pavaninder lal happens to be the the executive committee member of iags so so he's a colleague who works with us on a regular basis as well uh, Dr. Lal, uh, uh, Dr. Sheikh mentioned about the standardization. I think one of the major challenges that students face. So one, one thing is when you sit in the national level, you are looking at the number of doctors in different regions and you see diversity. My concern is diversity in training. So if, uh, if a surgeon gets to do, let's say, 10 appendix during his first six month post, the other surgeon gets maybe no appendix or one appendix, either because they are in different regions or different medical institutions for training, or uh, there, is a, there is an element of favoritism. Since both of you are trained in UK, where there is a standardized protocol that the person must do so many procedures before he moves on to the, so to the next level of training. What is being done to standardize medical education in India? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for this. Firstly, this invitation on the prime time of IAGS. It's a great yeah. honor to be here. Yeah. Uh, um, as uh, Dr. Sheth mentioned, uh, we at the National Board are uh, very actively engaging now with the yeah. stakeholders, uh, both the company, hospital sir. side, the people who thing, are uh, giving the training, and the students who are the people who are going to benefit from the training. And uh, one of the things that we have uh, moved on to is uh, uh, very active uh, uh, participation of the national board with the specialist boards. Uh, one of the unique features of the national board is that we have a specialist board for every subject, and that is contained of uh, you know top uh, leadership, uh, both from the academics and from the practicing hospitals. Of the Without best uh, the of uh, the uh, talents and intellectuals who can come together and guide us on the way the curriculum mm -hmm. or training needs to be uh, changed or modified. So that's uh, and uh, in the last few years, the national board has been engaging very actively in with these in these specialist boards and uh, making sure that uh, uh, we are getting a constant feedback on the training aspects of the. Uh, various uh, uh, subjects and the various trainees. 
uh, one of the new reforms that uh, has been uh, that has been rolled out now and which should become implemented from the current year would be an e logbook uh, for every student and uh, it would be uh, app based because most of the students are now having smartphones so we uh, would be launching it on the smartphone of the for the for every student and it would be having a faculty component and the faculty or the guide or the supervisor would be having the uh, other component of the logbook and uh, this all these uh, softwares will be integrated in such a manner that uh, when the cases are entered they will also be entered into the database of the national board itself so there will be a lot of uh, you know ease with which we will be able to record cases and uh, uh, document what are kind of training that is happening and uh, this will be going uh, and meeting one of the targets that you said that if there is a lot sided training we will have opportunity to get back to the trainers and uh, uh, engage with them to make sure that the training is of a certain standard also another new thing that has been uh, instituted at the national board is an yearly annual review process and this annual review process uh, really means that uh, once the accreditation is granted to an institution for a particular subject and a particular course uh, and they normally would be uh, you know relooked at at 3 years or 5 years when that accreditation finishes uh, now we would be engaging with them on an annual year basis where we will see what kind of numbers have been uh, performed in that one year what is the uh, faculty position uh, faculty position should not have reduced during the current year and so on. and therefore all these measures would go a long way in ensuring that a standardized training continues and the third thing third initiative that we have uh, taken uh, in the covid situation uh, and seizing it and making it to an opportunity was to start as a, as a teaching role which the national board had not previously had so actively uh, we have now started webinars uh, on a regular basis i am very pleased to say that uh, 25 subjects have already started we have allotted 1 hour to every subject and we have taken a very huge license which can reach up to 5000 students and you know that is a uh, maximum that you can have you don't have any any number more than that required and we are giving 1 hour to every speciality so for example it is uh, for 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 your subject uh, for our subject here minimal access surgery then 1 uh, hour will be for that minimal access surgery it could be for case presentation it could be for uh, cme lecture journal club seminar uh, case discussions um panel uh, 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 a, a, a symposia or anything like that so these are also newer initiatives and uh, i'm sure that other subjects which uh, we, we which have not yet started would also actively start and so we thought that at least one certain level of training for the first year second year third years would be imparted and there would not be a immediate rush for the students to you know attend cmes and workshops some standard training would be reaching to them wherever they are and uh, i think all these initiatives will go a long way in uh, fulfilling the standardization uh, required as you said and lastly uh, we are uh, very close to starting a national uh, level uh, very very high quality skills center and uh, that would become the you know the epitome of excellence for the entire country where at the to begin with we would it would be at one place and then maybe once the whole process is successfully rolled out uh, it could be replicated and you know the skills are something that are very very important the government of india has been uh, you know uh, um, has been supporting and promoting skills and all of us in medical schools and all of us in associations have also been targeting skill development it is actually that is the end result of everything they should be skilled surgeons or skilled physicians and whatever are the skills that are required for that particular speciality we would be able to teach them uh, and uh, these would be you know both in surgical specialties and non surgical specialties 
and this would go a long way in improving the uh, standards of uh, the uh, students in their respective subjects yeah wonderful so i think i think uh, that partly answers the question because the standardization is the ongoing process and uh, uh, you are making some beginning there uh, dr kanakvel you are getting all the questions so, so many questions are flowing yes. in yes please go uh, ahead sir i would like to take the next question to dr abhijit sir sir uh, the government of india from the health ministry aspect health provisioning and health education are two eyes of the health industry the health services availability are contributed both by the government structure as well as by the corporate structure and stand alone practitioner structure so how the board or how the uh, national medical commission is planning to utilize the educational infrastructure i would say i won't tell educational availability of clinical material many corporate hospitals are coming up many district level hospitals taluka level hospitals have enormous clinical material how the board or the national medical commission have is having a vision to utilize this clinical material for benefiting the students to learn from this clinical material sir so please unmute yourself sir yes sir uh, this is exactly what uh, i discussed uh, initially is uh, the one of the biggest challenge with the nmc national board of examination and the uh, healthcare infrastructure uh, under the government of india both public and private sector and the uh, independent practitioners i think the most important aspect is we need to find the way to integrate ourselves in a in such a way that a not a single resourceful bit uh, remains unutilized for the education number one not a single talented faculties should remain unutilized for the training purpose and not a single foundation which has all the capabilities to train the student should remain uh, uh, unutilized i think the integration talks about bringing the resources together to the best of the benefit of the students i will give you an example uh, just uh, in national board many times we discuss this example uh, uh, i'll give you one branch is uh, of and gynae now what happens that in the government uh, uh, institutions you have very strong obstetric department but your gynae department is normally average by and large no? so that you some place you may find very specially center but by and large the second import so on other side if you go to the corporate sector corporate sector has a far more uh, structured the uh, gynae uh, department then the obstetric department so simply if we integrate these resources in a way that student survey compulsory rotation sort of system or student have access to the either of the organization for the purpose of training of both obstetrics and gynecology then your purpose will be solved this is just an example i am putting uh, this is exactly what we need to do with whatever the resources we have it in the country there are huge resources which uh, which has gone unutilized and rightly the nmc as well as the national board examination both has started focusing on it like district hospitals across the country like uh, the uh, major government hospitals across the country and we all has got very strong foundation with the private organization but nd has now extended uh, its scope beyond 200 bedded institutions and now we have uh, we are reaching to almost 100 bed institutions and we are reaching to even lesser than that numbers in some of the sub specialties so what we are trying is trying to uh, uh, trying to encourage more and more institutions to come and participate 
into the postgraduate medical training program. Now, this is what the national board is doing. What the NMC is going to do is NMC is certainly going to strengthen the, all the possible district hospitals across the country to turn into a very active education center. And certainly the next step will be integrating these institutes and even to the private institutes in such a way uh, that the access to the education to all students are there. I'll give you an example that we have already taken a decision with uh, uh, previous Board of Governors and the National Board of Examination that where the government institutions are not running the MDMS courses or fellowship courses, they should be allowed to run these courses into the uh, public uh, sector organizations. And now a lot of pu public sector organizations have started DNB program and a lot of public sector organizations started even to the FNB program. They are going to start the FNB program. To the extent we have also now uh, convinced and the, uh, uh, the NMC has also been very cooperative to the extent that e even after the MD and MS, if there is a possibility of subspecialty development in particular area of the public sector, then they can start FNB there. There is no provision of fellowship programs in the NMC. So it's a basically a, a not for a, not like a recognized, but it's mainly for the training, uh, skill training of already the doctor, uh, postgraduate doctors. So it's like a more like a post doctoral degrees. And uh, many public sector organizations have also agreed to participate into this FNB program. So this sort of integration is certainly going to help us a lot. Uh, the second, which NMC is possibly going to take, uh, I still don't uh, have much access to the latest NMC uh, newer guidelines, but I, I understand that they also going to utilize the more and more faculties possible into the uh, public sector organization for the purpose of training. And this is what uh, uh, even to the extent that they will be treated as a visiting uh, doctors or sort of an adjunct faculties, but they will be utilized for the training. So let us conclude in this way. Uh, first, we need faculties to train the students. So for that, we need to pull much more number of faculties into the pool. Both National Board of Examination is doing it, as well as the uh, as well as the uh, NMC is also doing it. So that is number one. Number two is how we give an access to the students to the base centers. So. And the NP has already started external rotation uh, program, uh, and it is working well on uh, 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 particularly in certain institution and certain area. Possibly, I feel that in the coming year it will get more formalized clinical rotations, and certainly it will get much more useful for the students to rotate into the Institute of Excellence. So that is the number two. This is from the NDSFN. Uh, from NMC, we are awaiting the further reforms into this area. The third important is the, the now there is a, we are exploring the possibility of rotating the private uh, sector students to the government institutions for clinical rotations as well as the government is also going to sponsor their doctors to the private institution to train themselves into a different specialties and subspecialties. So that in, that's why I'm telling that there are so many reforms that if I will say that it will be, everything will be done overnight and tomorrow will be a great day, that's completely wrong. But over the time, I am seeing the very positive changes with all these things and this has been done with a lot of open mind. So I'm sure that uh, these all sorts of integrating uh, integration changes are going to happen. That is the second. Third, the important imp importance is if you make the institution as an educational hub, 
the state governments will also be uh, motivated to put the more uh, clinical resources into that institutions. And this is how the district hospitals we are expected to reform uh, by starting uh, the, this institution as a medical hub. So these are the main uh, uh, changes which we are expecting. And lastly is about the uh, research and education again I am telling that digital platform, which is widely accepted, and we must uh, utilize this platform to ensure that every student has uh, access to the great faculties across the country. And that's what National Board has done, and I'm sure the NMC will also do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Raman, sir. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Shet. So I think uh, you, you have mentioned so many reforms, you know, they are mind boggling and I don't know how they will be ultimately implemented and uh, definitely they will be implemented, I'm sure. But uh, Dr. Lal, I have heard you earlier, we have discussed it also and Dr. Shet has mentioned twice about using district hospitals as a training center for postgraduates. Can you elaborate on that? Because this is, this is the typical... Uh, British model where postgraduates are posted in a, in a, every hospital and they are, they are working uh, day and night. They are the backbone of NHS uh, as they are doing their training and they, they are also providing service. So what, what is on the cards? So uh, I'm very pleased. Thank you, sir, for this question. Uh, this, as you have uh, rightly picked up, district hospitals are uh, the place where about 60-70% of our population is attending the hospitals and uh, the government of India was concerned about how care could be extended to these uh, uh, hospitals because even 75 years after independence, for whatever reasons, uh, we have not been able to bring the resident scheme to the district hospitals. Uh, one, there are challenges because the hospitals are in peripheries, they're in the interiors, uh, the infrastructure of these hospitals is pretty limited. The faculty strength of the uh, hospitals are also uh, quite variable. They're not constant at all the times. But the patient load is always very, very heavy. And one of the learning experiences was the COVID scenario itself, where uh, the government found that uh, uh, the lack of resident uh, presence in the peripheries, uh, in the district hospitals, uh, made it to close, you know, big, large tertiary care hospitals in the main cities. You know, it was the other way around. Whereas uh, uh, some for something as basic as needing oxygen, which could have been done at any hospital and provision of uh, basic uh, life support services, nothing major surgery was required, not even major ventilation is the treatment for this condition. Uh, we were found wanting as far as our peripheral care was concerned. So with these two things in mind, two very big changes have been introduced in this year. And I'm very pleased to say as far as the government is concerned, they firstly, they gave us the mandate in the national board to uh, start diploma programs in these district hospitals. Uh, just for the information of everyone, the diploma programs were uh, discontinued or converted to the degree courses as far as the uh, erstwhile MCI was concerned because uh, the two-year diploma programs do not result into a medical teacher. Medical teachers need to be a full degree holder. So uh, the government found that uh, there was no use uh, having diplomas from medical colleges, uh, add a more one more year and let them convert into a degree so that at least the people coming out can be taken as teachers in the new medical colleges. And there is a great shortage of teachers, as you know. So uh, over a period of time, the diploma courses uh, uh, vanished or uh, just uh, disappeared from the scene. And uh, the diploma space became available. And uh, the government then mandated and uh, uh, wanted the national board to look at this possibility of uh, starting diploma programs in the district hospitals. And uh, so as a very major initiative in this current year of COVID, we have uh, launched uh, eight diploma courses 
in broad specialties which are present in the district hospital namely anesthesia gynae uh, pediatrics family medicine ophthalmology ent uh, medical radio diagnosis and tuberculosis and chest diseases so in these eight specialties uh, we have already started diplomas uh, courses we have announced diplomas and uh, uh, we have also provided now national board is very uh, you know uh, strategically placed to provide a career pathway for these people who do a diploma we at the national board have two types of dnb one is the three year dnb which is equivalent to the ms or md and one is a two year dnb which is referred to as a secondary dnb and the secondary dnb entry is to is from the diploma courses so these uh, diploma uh, candidates can uh, do the uh, career progression by uh, you know going for upgrading their diploma to a full degree by doing a two year uh, secondary dnb program so they have a career pathway in front of them and uh, the government also mandated for these uh, 50% of the seats in the district hospitals to be reserved for in service doctors that would encourage lot of mbbs level doctors to get upgraded to a better slightly better specialist position and give their best as far as they could uh, for the welfare of the people so this was one major initiative that we have launched i'm very pleased to say that we are uh, at the present moment evaluating uh, 1000 plus of these applications and uh, if all is well about 1500 to 2000 seats in the diploma category can be added in the new year 2021 through the neat pg exam and the second landmark initiative which the government of india has done through the uh, national medical commission now and the erstwhile mci is to have a compulsory rotation of every post graduate in the district uh, for 3 months period out of their 3 years period and this will be done in their uh, uh, latter part of the uh, you know post graduation that means in the second and third year not in the first and first and a half, one and a half year because they are doing their po- their thesis at that time so th- every uh you know every post graduate every subject from anatomy to whatever other clinical subject is will be rotating through this uh, uh through a, a district hospital designated for that particular medical college and this scheme is known as the district residency scheme it has been gazetted it will be effective from 21 onwards and both of these initiatives i think have would answer the concerns that you raised uh, dr goel about the Uh, care and enhancement of care for our uh, people attending the district hospitals uh, dr lal i think that's wonderful i have just two follow up questions to you because you know you made a very significant uh, uh, announcement or shared the, the the information one is that those who are doing diploma for two years you said they can come and do a a degree so will that degree be one year or two years Yeah, so that is a post uh, diploma uh, uh, secondary DNB, which is a two year DNB, sir. And therefore, uh, they have uh, technically done four years in that subject, two years in the form of a diploma, and two years in the form of a secondary DNB. And in that two years, they do their thesis and they do their uh, final year. So, uh, and these are usually at the same uh, centers where uh, the three year program is going on. and uh, obviously they are at uh, you know good, good hospitals with lot of workload with experienced faculty so that they are able to train both of these and the training for both these categories in that hospital is all is similar the there is no difference between the residency because they are equal residents one is getting exited in 2 years and the other would exit in 3 years in fact the person who is coming as a diploma is slightly better off because they have already spent 2 years in that specialty doing the diploma so they get a little bit of a you know better quality help uh, when they get a secondary dnb candidate and when we do accreditation for various uh, institutions and give them seats they we give them seats for both categories both for 3 year and 2 year course so there are enough number of seats but these are to be filled only by the uh, people who have diploma holders and there is a separate entrance examination for this purpose conducted by the national board okay so one more question about the same thing uh uh you know skepticism is always there it's so difficult to regulate medical colleges and corporate hospitals does the 
does does your board have the resources to monitor these district hospitals because they they are, they are a different ball game altogether a uh, very important question sir and this we uh, was discussed threadbare when we started this policy and uh, the as uh, dr sheth was telling uh, we have tried we have we are attempting to integrate the various uh, services and the district hospitals will be under the mentorship of a medical college and a faculty from the medical college in that specialty will be uh, assigned for the mentorship of these candidates so it will be under the supervision and tutelage of a uh, uh, medical college in the vicinity in which that uh, district is located so it will be a win win situation and there is a full possibility of the tutelage tutelage teachers to you know allow the district hospital post graduates to come to the main hospital see some bigger cases also and likewise the you know there the, a lot of exchange program and friendship and things will start once the, the whole interaction comes in and i think this is a game changing policy uh, uh, as far as the quality of care is concerned for delivery to the uh, people but also uh, to the trainees because the specialists in the hospitals are doing very high quality volume and very high quality work also they do limited amount of work they may do, in our specialty in surgery he may not be doing 25 30 operations he may be doing 10 50 12 common operations but doing them very well without any help without any resident and uh, now in such a system when residents come in you can imagine the kind of philip that the whole training will get so we are very excited about it but we keep our fingers crossed we will keep a very strong vigil on it we will have to monitor it very carefully and that is why uh, some new more diplomas Uh, which were uh, envisaged to be added to these eight have not yet been added, so that we could get the confidence of the rollout of the first eight diplomas, and then few more courses could also be added in the subsequent years. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kanagwel. You have so many questions. Yes, sir. I think uh, I uh, most of the questions are getting answered by and large, but this question will be next to Dr. Abhijit sir. Sir, uh, sir, I am going to address two things together to you. number one uh, there have been always some uh, <coughs> different subtle difference between the way the exams are done by the nmc exams are done by the national board national board always takes leverage or they are always more futuristic and they are quite early to implement the potential specialties sub specialties and micro specialties taking that into consideration in fact national board utilizes more of the medical college examiners national board utilizes more of the medical college based teachers also towards various exam part of the national board exams but uh, the students many of the questions sir uh, why is that there is a difference of uh, name to the degree offered by the national medical board uh, i'm sorry national board of examination and the national medical commission say can it be redesignated as ms national board or md national board together if mca gives it becomes ms and if national board gives can it be ms national board or md national board and then uh, they also would like to know sir still few of the fnb programs and few of the super specialized uh, diplomas program of the national board are not registerable in various state medical registries medical councils Uh, can you please highlight upon these differences and what are the reforms which are planned in future, sir? Sir, please unmute us. Yeah, first of all, first of all, sir. <coughs> now, National Medical Commission, everyone must accept that it has a direct obligation with the Parliamentary Act of Medical Act, and uh, it's not easy for them. to amend it or customize it to the to the general needs i think whatever they do they still are abide to the national medical act uh, it is modified but still it is it has certain level of restrictions on the way it advances further uh, in national board of examinations has a lot of leverage uh, because we are not regulating agencies like nmc 
So certainly we have we have a lot of leverage, as you rightly said, to restart to start new courses, new subspecialties, and everything. It's much uh, uh, possibly I would say we are a bit li uh, liberal for it uh, to save it. Now then comes the uh, equivalence issue. Now equivalence issue has been largely addressed. Uh, by uh, uh, Arts while uh, uh, MCI uh, BOG and equivalence has already been brought into uh, the broader specialty to a larger extent. Now it's up to the state uh, medical councils or state medical education body, uh, body to ensure that this equivalence is applied into the employment and uh, into the uh, job opportunities. So that has been done already. There's no need to change. The, the reason why you don't need to change is they both are different system to an extent. Uh, their curriculum and our curriculum, the principles are same, but the way it is handled is it's a bit in a different way. So I don't think so that uh, uh, we can match it in an absolutely equivalent way by all the aspects. But having said that, all uh, efforts have been done to ensure that the broader specialty DMBs will be equivalent to the MDMS program. So uh, with uh, very little now regulatory mechanism for it, so that part has been addressed. Now coming to the FNB, coming to the, I, I have already said that these programs are largely to enhance the skill of already existing postdoctoral uh, courses. So there's no question of recognition for these courses as such at this stage. Uh, the recognition comes to the issue where the super specialists are made, like DNB cardiothoracic surgery or uh, DNB in other super specialist, uh, specialist course. Because there were the original educational requirement of the National Medical uh, Council through the Medical Act has been implied. While this has not been implied into the uh, fellowship courses. Second, about the diploma courses. I don't think so. Diploma courses will be recognized by the NMC at this stage. Diploma courses, I'll tell you why. The reason is simple that diploma courses, again, uh, the primary, the basic principle and objective of uh, starting the diploma courses is to ensure that our undergraduate students, maximum number of our undergraduate students should have an access to a specialist training and they can go to the farthest part of the uh, regional medical institution to serve the country. So that is the main objective. The main objective here is to not to create a huge number of specialist cadre into one, uh, uh, one branch or one area. Otherwise, people will go out of the job. So, principle is simple, that there is a very clear objective defined uh, for starting the diploma courses. So, that is why diploma courses will not get an equivalence, but the guy, the students who will eventually uh, transit from diploma to the degree courses, then they will be recognized once they will get a degree. So, at the moment, the simple summary is DNB is made equivalent with uh, certain conditions, but uh, the conditions are not as harsh as it used to be before, number one. Number two is FNB and diploma is not recognized and it is unlikely to be recognized by the NMC. That is very clear. And number, uh, number three is as far as the job equivalence is concerned, it is up to the state uh, state health department to ensure that they, re they respect the equivalence uh, in employability of these doctors. So that will 
conclude this uh, question. Thank yeah. you, sir. Dr. Lal, you want to add something, yes, sir? So please unmute yourself, yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, supplement uh, what uh, Dr. Shed said that uh, in the NMC Act now, uh, uh, in the Act which uh, with, with which the NMC has come into being, uh, in the addendum to Section 37, a schedule has been added, and all the degrees which are awarded by the National Board of Examinations are uh, recognized registrable degrees, and uh, uh, there should be no problem to for any uh, you know commission in the state commission to uh, you know object to that so if there is anyone happening like that it is uh, it is going to be violative of the new nmc act and uh, i'm i'm sure uh, good sense will prevail on authorities and they will grant the uh, equivalence or recognition to the specialities that you were asking so that's just to uh, close that question it's loud and clear sir thank you thank you dr aman sir so, Dr. Lal, coming to some very specific questions, one of the things that we are realizing in a hurry to increase the number of number of specialists or number of uh, you know PG students, uh, we are we are overlooking the the number of faculty available or infrastructure available. So, if we had one faculty and there were n number of PGs, you now the PGs have been increased, but the operation theaters are not available the operation theater timings are not available. So if a PG would do, let's say just for the same example, 10 appendix in three months, now he probably gets only one appendix because there are too many uh, candidates for the same appendix. So how are you going to answer that? Is that not a worry that this will compromise the quality of uh, training for, of our PGs? Uh, I think that's a very, very important point which you have brought out, uh, Dr. Goel. Uh, and this uh, uh, concern is actively addressed in the National Board uh, when we evaluate the infrastructure of any hospital at the time of accreditation. We look at the numbers that are that are being done uh, and we are not, uh, you know, we are very, very careful in allotting the number of seats. However, the same uh, cannot be said for the medical colleges where uh, I have, uh, you know, as a part of the medical college I have been from, uh, the number of seats have got double, doubled up, senior residents have got doubled up, faculty members have increased, but the infrastructure has not increased to uh, commensurate with that level. And I think that challenge is uh, to be met, I would say, by both the hospitals and uh, the stakeholders and the government. It would not be right uh, for for uh, uh, for uh, us or for anyone to simply blame the government for being uh, you know um, re being responsible for doing that. I think equal responsibility rem remains with the interest with with the stakeholders who are there. You know the departments who are there, the medical superintendents who are running the hospital, the deans and principals who are running the college. There is never ever a dearth of money in the government system but for some reason there is a myopic view and people are not wanting to you know see this as a as a very important uh, concern or they don't want to take too much in their hands because when they ask for uh, too many things then they have to be given to be you know responsible for also for all those things so i would say that uh, this has been a little bit of a setback from the stakeholders end rather than the government end as far as the government is concerned, wherever I have seen, when we go and want something, they are pretty liberal about it. It is only our own fraternity and our own uh, people in the administration who are not able to show that much amount of uh, uh, liber uh, liberal view and uh, uh, a, a more lo longevity view that, you know, the, the, the hospital or the college has to run for 15, 20, 30 years from now. So they have they need to be you know uh, more uh, uh, vigilant from that point of view and i think that concern is something that uh, then being, comes uh, comes on the quality of training as you very rightly said and uh, this is a bit of a catch 22 situation uh, and uh, i would also say it is also sometimes the fault of the students also because they also accept the situation as it is 
you know we were i was uh, at one point of time i can just say uh, informally now that i i went for an inspection of a medical college uh, and up uh, for an exam in a medical college and i found that there were 16 post graduates there and there were only two faculty members it was a medical college it is about 10 years back and then uh, i asked how you are coping he says uh, we are just coping and they said why are you coping like that he says if we complain then we will be losing our md ms seats so the students are not complaining for that reason and uh, you know the uh, the whole system is just continuing and of course that point got highlighted and then more faculty were given and the training got eventually sorted out but it is sometimes the lackadaisical attitude from both the uh, ends of the stakeholders and the time consuming reforms and the other thing that i found is that people at the administration they are now getting made from seniority in government circuit rather than longevity of exercise so they when they are at retirement for 6 months they are becoming dean of a college or a medical superintendent they don't have a span in front of them if they don't have a span in front of them they will not be able to execute those changes if people are just made for seniority they are only there for 5 6 months either he will just pack his bags or he will do something new because they cannot start anything new which another person is likely to follow or not so that those are some of the challenges and government is quite aware about it but uh, i'm sure uh, uh, you know a lot of thought process uh, is required to basically sort this out uh, and i'm sure it will over a period of time okay dr kanagwel you have any question yes sir yeah. uh, i will ask a quick question to dr abhijit sir uh, sir uh, so far whatever uh, we have been deliberating has been in the early part of the learning process of a doctor so we talked about the undergraduate we talked about the post graduate we talked about various regulatory issues but sir uh, being a thoracic surgeon yourself you have spent enough time upgrading your skills after your mch qualification some or other uh, uh, we the regulatory bodies get them educated get them give them degrees and beyond 35 or so they are left to learn by themselves but then somebody skill gets refined after they get qualified all of us are evident yes effort well spent on one single surgery or one single sub specialty for 10 years or 5 years obviously give results but some or other we do not have a skill assessment system or skill imparting system somehow these people who have finished their mch or dm or dnb in specialization are left apart from themselves to fend themselves and we don't have a standardization or at this point we don't have a level playing platform for them to upgrade their skills what is the national board or what is the government at this point are looking at at the mid career level skill upgradation sir two things uh, two three things which is uh, uh even the uh, uh an mcm cis taken uh, uh, uh taken uh, initiatives and we are also going to take these initiatives it is interesting that uh, even in our accreditation process the skill lab was one of the important criteria for each and every institution but i can tell you sir that 80% of institution or more doesn't have this facilities and uh, since the complexities advancing technology and all these things has increased now this is a very uh, different situation in public sector you have a patient load in private sector you have a best quality equipments and experts to run the equipments so naturally otherwise they won't put an investment to the equipments so this is where you can develop lot of uh, skill uh, sort of uh, uh, training the problem is as i said that when this access will become more free to the students that students where they need sort of uh, exposure to the case load and they can be rotated to the public sector and the students who needs an additional training 
for the uh, skill based or equipment based training then they can they should be rotated to the private sector let us take it in your gastroenterology that the laparoscopic surgeons now if you need to develop minimal access or laparoscopic you have specific centers for it if the drb students is given an access to these uh, uh, institutions then possibly they will be able to uh, build it up now what is happening that i must accept that current resources for the skill trainings is not adequate and that is why we are suffering but the way uh, in which the aggressive manner the both the government of india uh, as well as the reg uh, regulatory body and mc and ourselves are uh, taking uh, the policy decisions is to ensure that in coming few years there will be a almost a equivalent time of arm. that's why i mentioned about three arms three pillars currently it's not a pillar at all but that's why i said that the skill based training will become an essential pillar in the training of dnb and the resources will be created available and accessible to the students so these resources initially will be created by the national board on the central level and like a spokes of the will eventually we will encourage the private sector institutions or even the governmental institution who have resources to make this as a center of uh, training and learning for the skill centers for the students so certainly this is the much needed reform of the hour and now it will not be on the papers and it will be certainly implemented and the access to the students will be increased to the best of its ability in uh, coming yes that i can assure thank you sir thank you sir chait and dr lal uh, you know we have a we we thought that we'll finish it in one hour and we have at least 30 40 or more questions still waiting which uh, the uh, participants have sent and so what we will do now onwards is we will have a rapid fire uh, round which which we elis we hope to have elicit a specific response a brief response from you so that we can finish it in next 15 yes. 20 minutes otherwise this yes. time will go on yes. and uh, before dr kanagwell starts having that rapid fire round at you uh, yes. i just wanted to make an observation it seems that first time the the policy makers are thinking of post graduates as a service provider when you are posting them in district hospitals uh more than the training that they are getting they are going provide providing a service to the to the citizen and then the question arises why should post graduates be asked to do a bond after their post graduation anymore and why should students be charged for post graduation by their respective medical colleges because i don't see this happening in united kingdom we are a uh, in a way replicating the nhs system uh, by using our post graduates to to provide uh, uh, health care as you said this is a integration which is happening so i am just leaving it as a thought because this is something which will require a major change in policy and there are med private medical colleges and other issues but i think this is very unfair that when we are using our post graduates and this is only in medical side that they are asked to do a service bond a rural service bond uh, it is not engineering it's not in mbas so i think the since both of you are at the helm of uh, affair, uh, affairs and you are you have the ear of the health minister and the prime minister as well i hope that in future we we see some movement on this because our uh, parents parents like us uh, your children also have uh, studied in medicine and know how much they need to spend and then the 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 sword of uh, uh, rural posting remains on their head so dr kanagwel uh, i i'm not asking for response from them because this is a major policy issue please go ahead and you can ask alternate questions from dr shet and dr lal about yes, about the specific issues yeah yes and and um, uh, maybe i can be very uh, very 
pointed questions and a curt answer so that we can take more questions in cover up uh, most of the important issues have been covered and few of the pertinent issues i'm going to touch upon uh, dr lal sir uh, there have been lot of questions about the exam dates can you briefly give an announcement on the neat exams which are going to come up the time schedule for the theory exams and practical exams which are on the anvil and there have been also one question will uh, time spent on treatment of covid be taken as loss of training period whether i will be given extension these are the quick things based on the time frame you can quickly answer then i move on to dr abhijit sir right so i think uh, the neat exam is going to be announced very soon we are just uh, waiting the nod from the government of india to give you the uh, date and uh, it should happen sometime in april or may so let them be ready that it could happen either of the two months uh, as far as the dnb exams are concerned though those who have done the theory exams in september which was the june 2020 session uh, most of the results have been declared now this month and uh, they will be all ready to take the exam in the month of uh, um, Ma- march and april so the practical exams will start in march and april and uh, in the same month uh, march and april the uh, theory exams for the new batch will also take place so that is the time schedule for the uh, you know the exams uh, and uh, what was the next last bit about it the, the pdcet exams sir yeah the post diploma common entrance test is uh, uh, always held about 2 to 3 weeks after the neat pg exam so as soon as the neat pg exam is announced the post diploma cet will follow about 2 to 3 weeks after that date and so it is something in april and may is something they can hope for as far as the covid period is concerned all the uh, trainees who have uh, done their training in the national board uh, during this period and finishing their training in year 21 the training has been extended for a period of 3 months in view of the covid uh, situation and uh, it may increase further in in line with the national medical commission uh, if they extended more than that but as far as the all the nbe training institutions are concerned it will be extended and it will be notified shortly thank you sir uh, dr abhijit sir um, uh, there has been a question on um, how the faculty is going to be trained in district hospitals you have been talking about utilization of the district hospitals and the mca mandates a professor to have uh, eight years and so many publication associate professor to have so many years of experience you want to take that question sir let me finish so how uh, and don't you think a student getting trained in a structured uh, faculty program a professor has come and a professor who uh, a consultant or a non teaching professor who is going to train the students in the district level hospitals how this uh, how does this difference being uh, addressed by the board or the nmc sir so uh, as far as the board is concerned as dr chet had pointed out we do not like to differentiate as far as the teaching is concerned between the separate silos of private and government and uh, uh, most of our trainings are also taking place in the private sector hospitals and there are no professors there but there are very high quality teachers and specialists who are excellent in their own uh, you know specialities so likewise the district hospitals where the diploma courses will start they will be having their uh, full degree uh, qualification and it is mandated that uh, uh, where there is a uh, where is there is a teacher with who is more than 5 years post uh, pg uh, will be recognized as a teacher for the diploma and in the absence of a senior faculty two junior who are 2 years uh, post uh, uh, qualification Uh, will be required so most of the places two juniors are never there it's usually the senior who is there in most of the uh, situation so uh, five year or more and normally speaking most of the people there are several years 8 10 20 years experience there so we don't think that there should be any compromise on the teaching the curriculum is very well structured for all these diploma programs and even our other degree programs and we actively engage with all our specialty <laughs> boards We revise it from time to time as the uh, situations have um, been, uh, you know, as the uh, program or the curriculum changes with advancement, so that the curriculum is up to date with the recent advances incorporated into it. Thank you, sir. 
now i move to dr abhijit sir sir uh, sir uh, there have been uh, questions about age limits of the faculty the national board and the nmc are uh, uh, what is the stand which is being taken on the upper age limit of teaching faculty is there any proposal to increase that number one and few states have 58 as retirement the central institutes have 60 or 65 as a retirement uh, what is that uh, as a in uh, like i would say implementing uh, body of the government what is your take on the upper age limit of the faculty sir sir in uh, national board we have already increased the uh, faculty age to 75 and after 75 also years also we have an academic committee which will take a call uh, to continue for couple of years more but certainly not uh, beyond uh, I, i i think not beyond 80 at any cost at this time uh, regarding the uh, nmc uh, it has been increased to a certain level and they are taking an advantage of retired teachers from army and other to uh, uh, to be working as a faculty but i am not aware with the exact uh, age limit for them but for national board we are clear that up to 75 we have increased uh, there there is up to 70 sir for the national medical commission all medical colleges is up to 70 years okay. and uh, we have it at 75 years yes thank you sir uh, the next question is uh, quite contentious but then i would like to put this question to dr lal uh, sir uh, the number of chances uh, especially in very fine procedures like liver transplantation or high level interventional cardiology procedures or like interventional valve replacement to coat i think many questions i am clubbing together uh, in corporate hospitals where fnb programs or dnb super specialty programs are done or many times are very micro specialized and even consultants uh, get to do very minimal procedures and on the bargain uh, a resident or a super specialty resident is not getting adequate hands on uh, what is that the board is sending envisaging to uh, streamline these type of high end specialties where uh, consultants get to do most of the procedures and we end up assisting all through right so i think uh, this is a uh, this is something that we have actively engaged with all the specialties specialty boards of uh, these uh, concerned uh, specialties and it is not restricted to just uh, super specialties in any kind of training there has to be a basic minimum number which must be uh, fulfilled or satisfied and uh, i think once the log book comes in it will become a very important source material because uh, it will be on record what is the number which has been performed independently what has been done with assistance and one on uh, you know and one which is done without assistance and with supervision so i think uh, these are important issues and we uh, tend to look at it and review them periodically with the specialty board members and we are specific that for the fellowship programs we would give it to only those centers where there are very high volume and ready to pass it on to the uh, to the trainee because the fellowship programs are mimicking the united states fellowship model uh where the candidate once comes out from a fellowship program should be able to be recognized as a good quality trained uh, uh, person in that particular uh, uh, super specialty or whatever it is where you know either a medical or a surgical field thank you sir thank you uh sir uh, one question to dr abhijat a uh, very specific question i say i think that there have been some select centers where uh, as the lal sir was telling continuously being guarded and monitored if they are not able to uh, maintain the quality and the number of cases students are getting shifted to the next possible center the few students have asked sir does it mean we have to undergo the remaining period alone or we have to uh, rem- finish the mandatory period lal sir please maybe yeah so you see uh, this is uh, maybe a matter re- related to relocation and the relocation is a very unpleasant task which we do not encourage at all however it are there are circumstances where we have no other way but to be forced to do it for example a hospital closes uh, some of the financial situations of the covid uh, ha, you know 
um, um, led to that uh, event. And also at some places where the uh, candidates were not very happy with the way the uh, the institution was, uh, you know, uh, you know, treating them or uh, for whatever reasons. So when the relocation takes place, it is very clear. It is only for the uh, remaining period uh, of the training, and uh, it the whole of the period is never repeated. And normally we would uh, 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 shift the uh, first year only that the, the candidate who is the first year entrant because the second year is already undergoing a thesis project. And the third year person is already uh, coming to the end of the training. So we would not like to touch the second and third year. But there are some institutions where we are forced to do it because the institution is getting closed or the situation is bad between the student and the institution. And uh, there is a, a request to do so either from the institution or from the student. And, uh, you know, there are uh, all other avenues are closed. Only then we try to do for the second and third year. Otherwise, the principle is for the first year. Uh, one last adding question, sir, before I hand over to Dr. Raman Goyal, sir. So the National Board has been very clear and categorical about the maternity leaves and the total number of holidays where a student is eligible per year and over a period of the entire training phase. Is there any ultimatum which is given on the number of hours per day a candidate yeah, I would say the maximum number of hours a candidate to be spent or the time working hours per week. Do we have any regulations on that, sir? Yes, sir, please. Yeah, so I think, uh, no, we do not have any working hour uh, uh, system as of now. We don't have any, we don't have any European working time directive working in India. So we do not encourage that. We do not want to say that... Uh, Training is a continuous process and the word resident means that you are resident in the hospital. So that is the whole ethos of training and uh, it's a residency based training. And uh, the more uh, they are there in the hospital, within the patients, within the training system, the more they will learn. So uh, we at the board do not have any policy for that. Um, uh, however, the leaves are, as you said, very clear, 30 uh, days per year. Uh, is allowed. So total of 90 days is something that is permissible. And if there is any extension beyond this number, then the person has to be undergoing that training uh, beyond that. And if sometimes the training does not finish before a cutoff date, then the candidate is not allowed to appear in that exam. And if somehow a candidate has uh, willfully or otherwise uh, hidden that information from us, appeared in the examination and at the final stage it is brought to our notice that the person actually had not completed the training the results of that exam are declared null and void and the candidate has to go for the theory and the practical exam all over again thank you sir and um, uh, now i hand over the proceedings to dr aman goel sir um over to you sir please okay. So I think uh, we have already extended the time quite a bit. I see that both of them are now looking at the clock. But I have two, two <laughs> important issues. I won't let you go away because they, they have been asked by almost everybody. So the first one is to Dr. Lal and the last one goes to Dr. Sheikh. Dr. Lal, the problem is that our uh, uh, post-MBBS doctors are all busy preparing for exam, the, 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 the PG entrance exam for years together. And that compromises the quality of care in hospitals where they are working as, a, as a RMOs or doctors. I, I, I'm aware that you are, the government is planning to do an exit exam. But exit exam in addition to the final year exam is basically a overlap. So what is, what is the, can you clarify what exit exam stands for and how it will be held? Uh, sir, thank you for this question. Actually, the exact clarity on this would be brought in by the National Medical Commission. They have just been formed and the uh, undergraduate and postgraduate boards are uh, yet to meet. Uh, the mandate uh, by law is that they are supposed to do the exam, uh, the next exam, uh, before 2023. That means before three years of the uh, promulgation of the Act. So uh, since the act has now come in through and the commission is completely in position, it will be in somehow in 22 or 23 that the next will come in. And uh, the exact structure of the exam is not yet known even to us. 
but uh, what i understand is that this will be a single exam there will be no two exams for the final year so it will be the passing exam for the final mbbs it will also be the ranking exam for the pg entrance and it will also be the licentiate exam to practice in the country thereby giving way to the fmg exam the fmg exam will no more be there okay thank you so i think i think that was that was essential to have a clarity on this and now dr shet a very very contentious issue uh all the doctors are very agitated indian medical association has taken a very tough stand you know what i am talking about iags has also clarified its stand to to stay with ima uh what is your you are a surgeon yourself i am not asking what government is thinking or what ayush ministry is thinking i am just asking you as a surgical colleague not not as a government functionary what is your opinion on this ayush doctors being allowed to start surgery or allowed to to do surgeries on a wide spectrum of things you know right from laparotomy and uh, uh, minimal access surgery for gall bladders and all without having adequate training or without having an infrastructure say the one thing i will i will tell that uh, uh, the ayurveda the shalya procedures and that i am not very uh, deeply aware with it so they justify based on the shalya shalya procedure and that's what they are doing it but my submission is simple that uh, allopathic uh, a procedure as its own science and it goes in its own way and own protocols and uh, procedures and certainly in whatever shalya procedures they are doing but it should not be mixed up with the allopathy so i think it's very clear because this will cause a lot of confusion uh, the main as uh, main uh, uh, feature of this confusion will be particularly when the student comes out of the uh, uh passing after passing the degree and everything and they want to aspire their career into sort of a different countries or anywhere or other places certainly this will create a lot of problem and uh, my submission is very simple i am not here going to criticize directly on the shalya procedure issues but i am uh, one thing which i always support that allopathy should remain allopathy and uh, it should not be mixed with the other sciences thank you so friends uh, this is what i meant when we started talking today that uh, we have two surgeons who are leading the the board and the surgeons have a way different way of looking at things the clarity of thought uh, they they answered all the difficult questions with with so much at ease that that it makes us realize that the country is in safe hands and the national board of examination uh, will whatever within their power will move ahead with the, with the guiding the uh, medical education in a proper way so thank you so much to both of you Uh, may i request the honorary secretary of iags dr s ishwar murthy to please uh, uh, propose a vote of thanks to both of our guests thank you thank you dr kanagavel thank you mr president dr raman goyal for choreographing and presenting in yet another blockbuster iags prime time today and i am sure all our viewers would agree it has been a packed filled absorbing day of, for all the academicians across our country because so many information have been shared by both the uh, great personalities here dr seth the president and also dr pavanendra lal i really like your attire also looking at the temperature in delhi i, I, I really uh, admire your attire uh, my personal greetings to you and thanks for your both of your valuable time and input and uh, i'm sure i mean uh, you all agree i mean another point i just want to share with the uh, role uh, like for example other countries like uh, i like uh, dr seth lal also trained 10 years in uk we know the system how they work in uk and also us in uh, american board of surgery as you know they have accepted some of the training by sages like face program as one of the prerequisite for the people to board certified same thing like in mrcs some of the basics 
some skill course from the royal college they take it into account so like that same ground because we all like uh, academicians we may be in a surgical society iags we all know we do on site and online academic programs and a lot of skill courses we can share your responsibility and if you could take our three day certificate and fellowship courses as part of the requisite if you could pass a message to all your post graduates if they come and attend because that will intensify if they come for example you run year two post graduates and come the certificate course of the basic uh, the laparoscopy endoscopy skill course and all the dip and be uh, super speciality they can come as a false course where advanced or a fudgy course like that we can do that that's my just a thought i just i was listening to you fascinated by all your input so, so this is another spectrum we could think a uh, win win situation not specifically to i just all the society medical and surgical societies are doing a phenomenal work i am sure collectively we can take our country even to a greater height because we know all of us india now high up in the ladder as far as the academic and also the medical tourism is concerned i think it is our own responsibility to do in that way and there are couple of things in the same tone all of you know that we as an iags we have been initiated by thanks to our president and academic initiative of the best pg thesis award I mean, uh, this year actually we have shortlisted ten postgraduates out of the applications we had. Five of them is going to get one lakh rupee as the best research. So both DIP and B and also MS. So we are going to have the interview. I want to see all the postgraduates listening to you. So next, it is going to be our Pongal present. We say in Tamil Nadu we are going to celebrate the harvest festival. So it's something like that. I am very very proud to announce that. And also in the same way, we are going to have our online fellowship examinations are on uh, going. So there are 300 people who have benefited by our, in spite of the COVID pandemic, we conducted the FAGS, EFAGS false courses, wherein they are going to have their online MCQ and also the online assessment viva. In the same way, the DPNP conducted. I have watched. how they did it so we are going to take a lot of uh, inputs from the way you conducted the way other uh, country so we are going to learn a lot from you so it's a win win situation for both of our association so thank you all and i'm sure all the fellows once they qualify there they'll come to our uh, igs 18th conference and convocation uh, in kwaimatur and you'll be there in a colorful convocation with us on 9th may what's your date it is because i'm sure 16th is a big day for india we all having the vaccine drive so i'm sure by may most of us all the medical fraternity will be ready to go and uh, mix with your friends and family so welcome to kwaim to and i'm sure we have had a great day thanks to doc pluses again i'm sure with the post graduates now watching i saw the youtube also a lot of kids there so thousands of people watched got all the inputs from both the great personalities thank you once again and thank you doc pluses thank you president for bringing yet another blockbuster thank you good night and um, again thank you ishwar sir uh, i take the uh, privilege of announcing uh, the next uh, prime time information we have uh, professor paul sugarbacker accepting to be the next important faculty i'm sure all of the surgeons would know the work done by professor sugarbacker on uh, surface malignancies and cytorectal procedures so that will be in the last sunday of uh, iags prime time and we have eminent uh, society presidents of across the globe uh, piped up on we'll be announcing shortly so we are trying to improve the bar of uh, iags prime time by the day and by the event we look forward for more academic collaborations and i thank the president and the secretary for allowing me to do this program and i also thank the invited faculty professor lal sir and professor abjad sir for making this day a very lively one and i'm sure lot of uh, more than uh, 3000 people have uh, come in and i'm sure this will be watched across the platform as we have in the iags channel and the doplexes channel available for a longer time so i'm sure it will reach more hands thank you one and all thank you iags and i thank all the participants in various channels both in doplexes iags and in facebook live for joining us this evening and making this evening a more successful one thank you one and all thank you thank you thank, thank you. you good night